Hello, and welcome back to our gardens. Well, after a fairly dry spring, this June has been wet and wonderful and the plants are loving it. But we still have a lot of work to do. So in today's episode, we'll mount up the potatoes we planted last month with some homemade goodness. Then we'll visit Hildeen, the historic summer home of Robert and Mary Lincoln, and chat with Andrea Lucchini, head horticulturist there. I call this my office, you know, like, it's a fantastic office. It's a beautiful place to work. We'll also explore the magic of a beautiful garden belonging to Sharon and Mike Rosenthal. So these are actually the potatoes that we planted together last month and they have grown quite considerably. I mean, these are about a foot and a half, maybe even two feet tall, but they do need a little bit of mounting up. And this just means taking any garden soil, it could be lawn clippings. In our case, we're gonna be using leaf mold to just mound some soil around their base so that they can actually create more tubers. And you wanna keep the tubers out of the sunlight or else like we talked about, they'll turn green and then they're not edible anymore. Leaf mold is an incredible and I feel untapped resource because we have so many trees that lose their leaves in the fall. We can really gather those leaves, store them in little areas. We have a couple of bays on our property where we just store the leaves and then they rot down over the course of six to 12 months and then they become this beautiful, rich, light, fluffy soil, and it's like garden gold. So if you're not collecting and harvesting your leaves for leaf mold, I do think you're missing out. So we just kind of place this at the base of our potatoes, mounding them up. So you can also put these leaves in a wood chipper or run them over with a lawnmower. That's a handy way of getting the leaves to break down quicker so you can use it quicker. After six months to a year has passed and the soil starts to look like this, really crumbly and rich, that is a perfect time for you to start using it in your garden. We did a homemade kind of sieve out of a few different branches from the property and a little bit of poultry wire, I think it's called, and just kind of nailed that together as a little frame to sift any of the sticks, twigs, weeds that have gathered or any of the leaves that haven't fully broken down. That way you're left with this really rich, fluffy, light, lofty soil. And there we have it. One of my favorite things about gardening here in the veggie patch is that it has this beautiful backdrop of ferns that was actually here when we moved in. And ferns are one of my favorite plants. I just think they're so magical and mystical. And they look like sea creatures or something. So we were fortunate enough to go and visit a beautiful garden created by a fascinating couple who love ferns as well. Tucked away a little over a thousand feet in the green mountains of southern Vermont, Sharon Rosenthal has created something unbelievable. Using the natural grade of the mountain and slabs of limestone unearthed when they built the house nearly 20 years ago, Sharon has painted her hillside with dazzling colors and textures. You enter the garden through an archway covered in romantic clematis, surrounded by a collection of vibrant flowers. Then you take in the full portrait she's created. She cleverly repeats bold colors and bolder plants through the hillside border. The tall spires of dwarf weeping white spruce provide height without creating too much shade, leaving room for the reds, blues, purples, and yellows to reflect their radiant glory in the afternoon sun.
Her planting isn't the only thing that repeats throughout the border. She adds a sense of whimsy to the garden with different decorative features, including upcycling old auto parts to become fun little fairy gardens. Sharon and Mike are fern experts and they have a beautiful collection of rare and native ferns to make any fern lover feel green with envy. They even have a labeled fern walkway to inspire you to start a collection of your very own. They've really created something wonderful here. If you'd like to see this absolutely gorgeous landscape for yourself, Sharon and Mike's garden will be open to the public as part of the Arlington Garden Club's Town and Country Tour on Saturday, July 22nd from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. To learn how to purchase tickets, go to arlingtongardenclub.com slash programs. You might remember the wonderful ladies of the Garden Club from our last episode. June in the garden is bustling with so much life and it feels like the flowers are just cascading out of their buds. We have the beautiful foxgloves, the roses, but there's one bloom that I think really represents June to me and that would have to be the gorgeous peony. Here in our garden, we have a few peonies that we inherited and then a few peonies that we've planted. These we, all, we inherited along with a few others that we had to transplant from a really shady area. This is a beautiful double pink, which I love. It has one of those white spiders on it right now, which represents patience <laughs> and peace. <laughs> And then we have this beautiful fuchsia colored peony that's another double, but the center is much more open. So you can see this yellow pollen in the center and the pollinators really love this one. We can look out and see swallowtail butterflies on it quite often. And it's really lovely. I mean, this one is enormous when you look at this. It's just, it's impossible not to notice a flower like this. It's almost as big as my head. <laughs> Now these beautiful flowers are going over right now in my garden, but we were lucky enough to pay a visit to Hildeen where their peonies are in peak bloom right now. Well, gardening is important for a lot of reasons. Gardening is important to provide for bees and um, butterflies and all sorts of other insects, but it's also important for us too, right? To feed our souls, there's a, there's a balance. So we talk um, here a little bit about re reciprocity, the concept of reciprocity. You know, the gardens take care of us, right? They feed our souls, seeing these beautiful flowers and the smells and just the calm and peace we can get being out in the garden, listening to the birds. And so we have to give back. So that's where the reciprocity, that's where the ecological gardening comes in for me, is taking care of these organisms that are taking care of us. My name is Andrea Lucchini, and I am a horticulturist. I don't have a professional certification to be a horticulturist, but I have a master's degree in ornamental horticulture or from the Department of Plant and Soil Science at the University of Vermont. I started out briefly working, after I got my master's degree, I started out briefly working at a garden center and realized the selling wasn't for me. And I moved to working, I worked at the North Carolina Arboretum in Asheville. Um, so my career has mostly been in public gardens. I have been at Hildeen for 11 years. I just love working here. I mean, look at this. I, I call this my office, you know, like it's a fantastic office. It's a beautiful place to work. Hildeen was built by the son of President Lincoln, Robert Lincoln. He built this as a summer home to enjoy with his children and grandchildren. It was finished in 1905 and eventually passed down to Robert's granddaughter, Peggy Beckwith. Peggy Beckwith lived here for most of her adult life until she passed away in 1975. She passed the house on to the Church of Christ Scientist, 
Um, and there were a few intervening years the church was going to sell it for development and people in town got together and raised the money to purchase it and it became the nonprofit we are today. Robert hired a landscape architect to help him with the overall property. We have 412 acres now. That is about the extent of the property that Robert had in 1905. And so a landscape architect by the name of Frederick Todd worked with Robert on the grounds here. And the architect actually wanted a um, terraced formal garden off the west side of the house, um, down which obviously where the terraces are, um, but Mary really wanted it in the back of the house here. Her sitting room is this in the second floor center room. So the garden is centered on her sitting room and her daughter Jessie designed it to look like a stained glass window as viewed from that window. So the privet hedge makes up the letting of the stained glass window and the flowers make up the colors. So the privet hedge that you see today is actually original. We have not replanted privet. Privet is an invasive plant, so we don't recommend it. And we shear it every week to keep it looking like this. So it wasn't until about 1980 that people got back into the garden. Privet is actually a large shrub growing to maybe seven feet tall. And so at that time in the early 80s, it had grown to its full height. And you can imagine, you know, the garden was very overgrown. But I talked to the people that first got into the garden and they, you know, got in past the privet hedge and found huge clumps of peonies. And that's why Hilding's known for our peonies today. This is one of our named peonies. Uh, this is Jessie Lincoln. When Je Jessie, when she, I always call her she, when she emerges in uh, the spring, the whole plant is this deep red color uh, that you can see here. And then, you know, as it grows, it turns green on top and still retains that red a lot. And then this is the flower just starting to open. It might be, you know, closed up a little bit for the night, but it's a pale, it's a semi-double pale pink with a lot of the splashes of that darker pink um, in the petals. Jesse designed it to look like a stained glass window, as I said. The privet hedge um, is the letting in the window and the flowers make up the color. When um, the first gardeners came in in the 1980s, mostly a group of volunteers, they knew that story through oral history, but they didn't know exactly what plants were in the bed. And they felt like if it's gonna be a stained glass window, then we should do color blocking is what I call it. So they went back in and put in the four corner beds, they put all yellow flowers. In the two middle at the top and at the bottom um, are all pink flowers. The four in the center are all white flowers and the two outer middle are blue flowers. The privet hedge at that time was overgrown and they slowly cut it back to try to get it back to the height they knew 18 inches tall was about the preferred height for it for this garden. But it kind of was scraggly and didn't, didn't look that great. So in the early 2000s, they did what is called a rejuvenation prune and they cut the privet hedge all the way to the ground and let it reflush. So that's the privet we're working with. So those root stalks um, are mostly original privet. You can tell in different spots, there's some different color and maybe a different leaf. So there may be individual ones that were replaced. We found a few apple trees sneaking in the privet hedge. We finally realized, hey, this isn't privet. And you can see this year, especially, there's a lot of dead spots through the privet, but it'll flush out. We need some rain and it'll flush out and be beautiful once again. We found in the house somewhere a drawing um, that was done by Jesse. We can tell our archivist compared the handwriting um, to other known Jesse handwriting pieces, and she confirmed she believes it is Jesse's handwriting. And it's clearly the layout of the garden, but if you look at it closely, the privet hedge isn't represented on it, and wouldn't there wouldn't be room for it in the drawing as is. So we don't know what iteration that was, but we certainly know at least the beginning of an idea for the garden. And it was not in a color blocking style. There was a mix of perennials in most of the beds and then some of the beds were just full of phlox or roses or hollyhock, something like that. Um, and then in this area where we're sitting right now, they had more plantings. They had ornamental grasses and things like that. And we do have some pictures from, we think they're from the 1920s but they're fuzzy black and white pictures. It's hard to tell what flowers are there. And a few of them, you can tell there's peonies in there. But beyond that, it's really hard to tell. 
what was in here. But that plant list gives us at least an idea of the plants they were interested in planting. As you stroll through the garden, the majority of the peonies you see are all from that time. So we don't know, my joke is always that they didn't leave me their plant labels. So we don't know what most of these peonies are. We've gotten a few figured out and we've gotten a few named and registered with the American Peony Society as new unique peonies. Um, Cause peonies can, especially the single flowered varieties have all that pollen and nectar. So they're visited by bees. And so bees are cross pollinating different peonies and then they go to seed. Most gardeners don't let them go to seed. They deadhead them. But when you let them go to seed, you could be coming up with some new, beautiful, gorgeous peony. So that's probably what happened. And we have one called Hildine and we have one called Jesse Lincoln. This is the second one um, we have registered with the American Peony Society. This one is called Hildine and it's a single flowered type peony um, with these pale pink petals with that splash of deep pink throughout. So another really unique peony, very special to Hildine. We called the Jesse a semi-double peony and that means it's got all these rows of petals here. And the way a lot of flowers become doubles, this is important because it relates to pollinator gardening. It's an actually a mutation that turns the stamens into what botanists call petal-like structures. So you can see here how some of these are um, petals and then there are a few stamens, whereas compared to that single flower, the stamens are big and full of pollen. These stamens are little. This isn't um, supporting pollinators very well. There may be a little bit of pollen on some of these stamens, but especially some of the bigger full doubles, there's nothing there for pollinators. This is a single flower type peony. You can see I'm brushing off all that is pollen that gets collected by bees. So I try to stick with some level of history here in the formal garden. But what we always think about is um, not trying to recreate the past, but trying to honor it. So we're honoring the past with the privet hedge and the peonies, but looking towards the future. Again, using things that make sense today. They might not have been what they used in 1905, um, but they're what makes sense today and still honoring this beautiful place, landscape, and garden. Surely they had to do some blasting to make this the garden space. So one thing, going back to the landscape architect that I read about him um, was a couple quotes really stood out to me that he believed in working with nature herself as partner and the wise use of natural resources. So blasting out <laughs> the whole space to create a garden probably wasn't his first choice. So clearly they did a lot of work to put the garden in here, but I really appreciate <laughs> that I get to call this my office now. Ecological gardening, if you will, one of the main things about that is, you know, an easy way to say it is messy gardening. People love it when I tell them that they can leave their gardens messy. So that's my number one tip. And so ecological gardening is trying to work with nature rather than against nature. Um, you know, sure, peonies were not native to here, but they were native to a place that has a similar climate and so they do okay. Other things aren't smart to bring here um, and we shouldn't do that. We do a lot of native plants, even within this formal garden, we have a lot of native plants because they're pretty, because they support native insects and because they're adapted to this climate and they do well, you know? And then we don't cut back most of our gardens. I do cut back the formal garden because I just don't have time in the spring to do all the cut back. Um, but it's best for pollinators and other beneficial insects to leave your gardens messy, if you will, in the fall. So just leave them alone. That's providing habitat and winter protection for all those wonderful little insects that we rely on and don't really realize that we rely on. Butterflies, bees, other teeny little things that might gross you out but are really important in the garden um, are nesting under those leaves. They may be nesting in hollowed out stems, things like that. So messy gardening is the way to go. You'll notice weeds in our lawns and those are on purpose as well. It used to be that they sold, like at the time the Lincolns built this house, I've looked through garden catalogs of that era, and they sold clover seed with grass seed because clover is in the legume family and all the legumes 
um, fixed nitrogen, which means they take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into plant available nitrogen. There's little nodules on the roots of everything in the legume family um, that there's bacteria in there um, that do this conversion. And so it's feeding nitrogen to the plant roots, which is what fertilizers do. So after the wars, chemical companies needed something to do with their pesticides. So they told us we had to kill all the, you know, weeds in our lawns and we need these perfect pristine monoculture lawns. And then we had to buy fertilizer from them to make our lawns green because those weeds are gone and now they have to be fed and that sort of thing. And again, if you think about nature and letting nature evolve as it will, it takes care of itself. Um, so we need to encourage that. Um, and support that instead of fighting against it. So weeds in our lawn, there's a ton of clover right here. I'm looking at all this clover, which is great for your lawn. When it blooms, the bees will feed on it. And other things in the lawns are great as well. We have a ton if you look through all our lawns and they're, they're growing where they naturally wanna grow. The thyme, the heel all, the wild strawberries, um, it's all good stuff. So that's another tip, leave your weeds in your lawn and other areas if you can have weeds in other areas like if you have a meadow area um, and goldenrod you know people think of that as a weed it's a fantastic late season nectar and pollen source for bees it's one of the latest things that bloom in the fall um, so it's really important to have people often ha ask how we get our peonies so big and we're lucky enough to be able to close the loop on our resources here and since we have farms we are able to make our own compost um, with a mix of manures and garden clippings and those sorts of things. And that's what we um, feed the gardens with instead of chemical fertilizers. We use our own wonderful compost. June is absolutely stunning because we're just getting those fresh greens and fresh flowers, you know, the first real variety and flower color. The pollinators are coming out. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous time at Hildeen. This is Festiva Maxima. Um, and it's white and has these little pink in the center. I just love this one. Um, and you can see, or I might have shaken them off, but ants all over the peony buds, um, which people ask about and they always ask, how can I get rid of my ants? And don't get rid of your ants. This is another symbiotic relationship in nature. The sepals, which is this outer covering over the petals, this greenish outer covering, um, secretes a sticky substance. I don't know what it is, um, but you can see on some of them, this one is really sticky, it's shiny. Um, and the ants are going after that sticky substance. And we have to believe that it helps the peony to open if it's getting that sticky substance off to make it easier for the flower to open. I don't believe it is technically required. I think in a you know sterile lab, the peony still would open, but it's helping the ants, it's helping the peony. So leave your ants. If you wanna cut them for cut flowers, it's better to cut them when they're still in bud stage. People call it a marshmallow stage. So if you touch the bud and it kind of feels like a marshmallow, that's a great time to cut it to bring it in. And you're able to, if you do it then, you can usually shake off the ants and it's easier to get them than um, when they might be in that big, beautiful bloom. Hildeen has programs all throughout the year on all sorts of topics. This summer, there's a lot of great things happening. Butterfly walkabouts, nature walks on Saturdays, Thursdays, what's happening here um, in various places around the property, including the gardens. Um, yeah, just lots going on. If you check our website, www.hildeen.org, you'll find our calendar of events and see all the fantastic programs we have going on. We just hope people will come visit us at Hildeen and see these beautiful gardens for themselves. We want them open and available for all people to enjoy and just spend some time here um, and appreciate all that we have to offer on this beautiful property. Well, that's it for this episode. I really hope you enjoyed visiting these inspiring gardens with me and enjoy the rest of June. It is such a gorgeous month in the gardening year. I'll see you next month in our gardens. If you'd like to support this program and others like it, you can donate by going to gnat-tv.org slash donate. Thanks for watching.